In this presentation, we'll talk about IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. This is applicable to tens of millions of people. Perhaps you have a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, or perhaps you just simply call it diarrhea or constipation. Whatever the title, whatever the label, it's irrelevant. You're suffering from symptoms. You've probably also seen maybe 10 doctors throughout the years who've tried to help, but continue to run tests and tell you, eh, there's not much we can do for you. Well, you just wanna feel normal, you wanna lead a normal life, and we're gonna to get to the root cause of what's going on. You've come to the right place. On this slide, the key term is symptoms directed treatment. Again, what I do philosophically is get to the root cause, which is your dysbiotic microbiome. Treating symptoms is not my philosophy. Treating symptoms is what you've been doing for years. People continue to think there's just some magic in a bottle somewhere that's gonna save them. They continue to think that they can eat anything they want and there'll be no consequences. If you continue to only treat the symptoms and not address the root cause, there are long-term consequences. In this presentation, we're gonna try something philosophically different for you. In this paper, these researchers reviewed the role of diet in IBS. Let's take a look. In this review of 73 IBS original research papers, the authors identified the main food suspects we've known about for years and we'll see in subsequent slides. However, you have to understand that there are subdivisions within food intolerance. For example, the most basic would be lactose intolerance to dairy products. It's a simple osmotic situation in the gut leading to diarrhea and can and should be resolved by the avoidance of dairy products. The others are a bit more complex and the immune system is involved and dysregulated in large part because the gut microbiome is dysbiotic. To reinforce the connection between diet and IBS, we have an oldie but a goodie. Here we have one of the papers from the review in our previous slide. I'm not going to cover everything here, but highlight the key aspects. We see dairy products as top offenders. This is due to an immune response to the various peptides within the proteins. Dairy is the worst food you can consume for an inflamed gut. We also see gluten-containing products on this list. Additionally, in immune response. The foods we see with the yellow arrows are tied to the immune system, but not from an antigenic perspective, but from a hypersensitive histamine response. These are foods which can generally be added back sooner to the diet as we rectify the root cause. Lastly, we see in green foods rich in prebiotics, which can cause gut symptoms, but are actually a good thing. This slide in part justifies how I recommend taking gluten out of your diet in my protocol recommendations at the end of the presentation. And to have issues with gluten, you probably think you need to have celiac disease. Not true. Here we see significant increases in various symptoms associated with gluten in the diet for non-celiac subjects. Again, we're talking about a dysregulated immune response due to the bacteria in your microbiome being out of balance. When the bad actors are in charge, a slew of things occur thy primary outcome being a hyperinflammatory immune response. Your immune system is responding to a chronic invasion with the alert signal on at all times, ready to defend at all costs, which includes casualties by friendly fire, components of you. Here's a powerful study which will hopefully motivate you to follow my number one dietary guideline, the avoidance of dairy products. The poor children in this study were suffering from terrible constipation where previous treatment with laxatives had failed. Most of the children had their constipation resolved by excluding dairy products from the diet. I always see the use of laxatives, including magnesium citrate, in patients with constipation. This is the lazy approach. The far healthier approach is to rectify the underlying issues. The problem is that most practitioners don't understand the scientific fundamentals. Here's just one last paper on diet and IBS from many others I could have chosen to drive home the point. Here we see a multi-phase trial looking at food intolerance. We again see the same usual suspects as we've seen before. What usually happens is that someone with IBS will slowly begin to identify which foods are problematic and avoid them. However, over time, these people paint themselves into a corner eating fewer and fewer foods because as time goes on, the hyperactive immune response targets more and more peptides. I've seen people down to eating white rice and plain chicken breast. Along with this, you can develop systemic issues with time, such as autoimmune conditions. So I want to be clear, I'm not advocating food avoidance. I'm advocating addressing the underlying problem with the microbiome. My approach is largely the opposite of the approach on this slide, the low FODMAPS diet. I have a whole presentation dedicated to this topic. For our purposes here, I'll highlight a few things. One, I believe dairy products should not be a part of our diet. 
Two, there has to be temporary avoidance of problematic foods to help subdue the hyperactive immune system. And three, instead of eliminating many healthy foods which are full of prebiotics, which in turn feed a long list of health-promoting bacteria in microbiome, my protocols include properly dosed and blended supplemental prebiotics designed for your microbiome and based on your symptoms. And what are my protocols based upon? Studies like this one. I've analyzed all of the human fecal microbiome IBS studies available, 54 in total. This one had 55 IBS diarrhea subjects as compared to healthy controls. Here we see some pretty classic results of good versus bad. On the left in green are all of the microbiome taxa found in this study to be significantly higher in the healthy controls. Here we have a number of your key health promoting bacteria in the gut, names you've never seen before, none of which are in the probiotics you can buy in supplement form. On the right side are a number of key disease-associated bacteria within the microbiome that were found to be significantly higher in the IBS diarrhea subjects. These are key opportunistic pathogens at the root cause of inflammation. They are not kept in check because the good bacteria on the left have been significantly reduced in these IBS subjects. Here's another one of the 54 studies I used to analyze the microbiome in IBS. This 2012 paper highlights a few points. The technology they used to assess the microbiome was PCR. PCR technology got us started, but is very limited in scope. With this technology, you can only use a handful of what are called primers. In other words, they had to make an educated guess as to which taxa they thought played a role in IBS and search only for them. It limits the findings, but nonetheless, this old technology does line up with the findings from the new technology. The primary differences being scope and metabolomics. This study found E. coli to be significantly higher in IBS subjects, while conversely, bifidobacterium and the C. leptum group, it's an old term, were found to be significantly higher in the healthy controls, all in line with the general findings. The last item from this paper are the differences found in bile acids. The microbiome plays a crucial role in bile acid metabolism, and bile acids, which are actually hormones, play a large role in our health. You can see to the right the primary bile acids in the healthy subjects are far lower than those in IBS. This imbalance is an indication of dysbiosis, which is exemplified nowhere better than in C. diff infections. Now let's just take a look at one more individual paper to give you an idea of where my data points come from. Here the researchers included 70 IBS diarrhea subjects versus 46 healthy controls. Again we see typical findings. The bacteria found to be significantly higher in healthy controls were Fecalibacterium, the superhero of the gut, E. rectale, another amazing health promoter, and subdoli granulum. We also see to the right figure F, which highlights the correlations of a number of taxa to IBS severity and symptoms of anxiety and depression. You may already know that mental function is strongly impacted by the gut. Significant differences are shown with an asterisk. For example, the genus Dialister, for some reason yet to be elucidated, is significantly inversely correlated with anxiety and depression a good thing, as well as IBS severity. When I compile all the data from the 54 IBS studies, I get the chart you see here. You'll find this information nowhere else. What you see here is the average microbiome profile for IBS, the keystone taxa, if you will. In IBS, taxa such as Fecalibacterium prausitzii, Odoribacter, Allostypes, and Bifidobacterium really stand out as health-promoting, whereas classic opportunistic pathogens such as Streptococcus Asherachia and Ruminococcus navis are consistently significantly higher in IBS. Note lactobacillus denoted with the blue arrow. Most of its IBS data matches that of the bad actors, and yet millions of people take it as a probiotic in an attempt to help with IBS. Why would you take lactobacillus probiotics if the majority of the time subjects suffering from IBS have more lactobacillus in their microbiome than do healthy controls. If we just look at constipation with an IBS, we get these data points on this slide. Many of the IBS studies were focused on IBS in general or IBS diarrhea. For my constipation regimen, I take into account all of the data which yields excellent results. If you have any doubts, read my testimonials. Now some researchers and practitioners get obsessed with methane producers when considering constipation. But as I've done the complete analysis, I'm not relying on one paper or word of mouth. I can tell you that the data for Archaea, the methane producers in question, is very scant and doesn't strongly lean in one direction or the other. Nothing like what we saw in our previous slide. So as I've said many times, 
Once you control the bacteria, you control the environment. If we strictly look at the data in diarrhea, it looks a lot like our first chart. Here we have a couple things to point out. The amazing genus Carprococcus makes an appearance here. It seems to be particularly helpful in diarrhea. There must be more to this story than just butyrate production, as a number of our health promoters in IBS produce butyrate. Also, the genus Prevotella has made a big switch from being consistently healthy for constipation to being more associated with diarrhea. Now let's give some perspective to the health-promoting tax that we've seen in IBS. This is a slide you'll be seeing off in my presentations. This is the accumulation of thousands of hours of work, determining the key players in the microbiome. Collected here are the great universal or almost universal health-promoting taxa of the gut. These health-promoting bacteria have been found to be consistently, significantly higher in healthier cohorts and significantly lower in the unhealthy ones across all disease states, including IBS. The darker the green, the stronger the data as a health promoter. Out of a thousand or more species in your gut, this handful plays an enormous role in your health. There are a few health-promoting genera not listed here like Bifidobacterium, Allostypes, and Odoribacter, which are in other phyla. But these listed here are the main determinants of health in the gut. These incredible bacteria listed here can occupy a lot of real estate and perform many health-promoting functions beyond the highly beneficial one of butyrate production. The blue arrows mark the tax as shown to be significantly reduced in IBS. In order to increase their number, you have to feed them the fuel they love. By doing so, you drastically improve your microbiome and by extension, your overall health. Here I give you more perspective you'll find nowhere else. On the bottom right is the superhero of the gut, almost always associated with healthy controls versus any health condition. Above it, we see the data for the genus Bifidobacterium, which is usually in your probiotics. And although its data across the board is not as good as Fecalibacterium, it's still impressive and a proven health promoter. On the top left, we see the genus Streptococcus, which is known to house a number of opportunistic pathogens, bad actors. In an IBS, it is significantly higher in IBS subjects versus healthy controls. And last, on the bottom left, we see data for the genus Lactobacillus. As you can see, its profile resembles that of an opportunistic pathogen like Streptococcus above, instead of a health promoter like Fecalibacterium to its right. This is data across multiple diseases which I've analyzed over the years. So which prebiotics are best suited to treat the dysbiotic microbiome in IBS? One has to take into account their effects on the key health-promoting taxa which are significantly reduced in IBS. And the dose has to be sufficient to drive environmental change. And we have to consider symptoms. If you found this presentation informative and you think addressing the health of your microbiome might be a good idea, then in the protocols tab of my website, themicrobiomexpert.com, you can find a science-based protocol for this condition, among many other conditions. You're also invited to view and read my testimonials in its respective tab.